Welcome to the Wolf and the Crows, Freelance, sitting around, talking about thrones. Valor Magulis, and welcome back to the audiobook of Fire and Blood with the Wolf and the Crows. Make sure you check out some other, other videos and playlists um, on the YouTube channel. We've got a playlist there of interviews with cast and crew from Game of Thrones, some uh, location videos showcasing all the different locations around Northern Ireland. Uh, that were used in filming. Uh, what else have we got? We've got some uh, movie reviews on there from Netflix and blockbusters from the cinema. Um, and he's also got a series of Pints of Ice and Fire, where he's reading his favourite chapters from George R. R. Martin's A Game of Thrones. So check all them out. There's plenty of other content on there to keep you busy and occupied until House of the Dragon comes out, probably next year. So for this week, Fire and Blood, Chapter 12. Heirs of the Dragon, a question of succession. The seeds of war are off planned during times of peace. So it has been in Westeros. The bloody struggle for the Iron Throne, known as the Dance of the Dragons, fought from 129 to 131 AC, had its roots half a century earlier, during the longest and most peaceful reign that any of the conqueror's descendants ever enjoyed that of Jaharis I Targaryen, the conciliator. The old king and good queen Alysanne ruled together until her death in 100 AC, aside from two periods of estrangement known as the First and Second Quarrels, and produced 13 children. Four of them, two sons and two daughters, grew to maturity, married, and produced children of their own. Never before or since had the Seven Kingdoms been blessed or cursed, in the view of some, with so many Targaryen princelings. From the loins of the old king and his beloved queen sprang such a confusion of claims and claimants that many maesters believe that the dance of the dragons or some similar struggle was inevitable. This was not apparent in the early years of Jaharis's reign, for in Prince Aemon and Prince Balon, his grace had the proverbial heir and a spare and seldom has the realm been blessed with two more able princes. In 62 AC, at the age of seven, Eamon was formally anointed Prince of Dragonstone and heir to the Iron Throne. Knighted at 17, attorney champion at 20, he became his father's justicar and master of laws at six and 20. Though he never served his father as hand of the king, that was only because that office was occupied by Septon Barth, the old king's most trusted friend and companion of my labours. Nor was Balon Targaryen any less accomplished. The younger prince earned his knighthood at 16 and was wed at 18. Though he and Aemon enjoyed a healthy rivalry, no man doubted the love that bound them. The succession appeared solid as stone. But the stone began to crack in 92 AC when Aemon, prince of Dragonstone, was slain on Tarth by a marish crossbow bolt loosed at the man beside him. The king and queen mourned his loss and the realm with them, but no man was more bereft than Prince Balon, who went at once to Tarth and avenged his brother by driving the merman into the sea. On his return to King's Landing, Balon was hailed a hero by cheering throngs and embraced by his father the king, who named him Prince of Dragonstone and heir to the Iron Throne. It was a popular decree. The small folk loved Balon the Brave and the lords of the realm saw him as his brother's obvious successor. But Prince Aemon had a child, his daughter, Rhaenys, born in 74 AC, had grown into a clever, capable and beautiful young woman. In 90 AC, at the age of 16, she had wed the king's admiral and master of ships, Corals of House Valeron, Lord of the Tides, known as the Sea Snake, after the most famous of his many ships. Moreover, Princess Rhaenys was with child when her father died. By granting Dragonstone to Prince Balon, King Jaharis was not only passing over Rhaenys, but also possibly her unborn son. The king's decision was in accord with well-established practice. Aegon the Conqueror had been the first lord of the Seven Kingdoms, not his sister Visenya, two years his elder. Jaharis himself had followed his usurping uncle, Magor, on the Iron Throne. 
Though had the order of birth alone ruled, his sister, Rainey, had a better claim. Jaharis did not make his decision lightly. He is known to have discussed the matter with his small council. Undoubtedly, he consulted Septon Barth, as he did in all important matters, and the views of Grand Master Elisar were given much weight. All were in accord. Balon, a seasoned knight of 35, was better suited for the role than the 18-year-old Princess Rainey's or her unborn babe, who might or might not have been a boy, whereas Prince Balon had already sired two healthy sons, Viserys and Damon. The love of the commons for Balon the Brave was also cited. Some dissented. Rainey's herself was the first to raise objection. You would rob my son of his birthright, she told the king with a hand upon her swollen belly. Her husband, Cornus Valeron, was so wroth that he gave up his admiralty and his place on the small council and took his wife back to Driftmark. Lady Jocelyn of House Baratheon, Rainey's mother, was also angered, as was her formidable brother, Bormund, Lord of Storm's End. The most prominent dissenter was good Queen Alysanne, who helped her husband rule the Seven Kingdoms for many years and now saw her son's daughter being passed over because of her sex. A ruler needs a good head and a true heart, she famously told the king. A cock is not essential. If your grace truly believes that women lack the wit to rule, plainly you have no further need of me. And thus, Queen Alysanne departed King's Landing and flew to Dragonstone, or her dragon, Silverwing. She and King Jaharis remained apart for two years, the period of estrangement recorded in the histories as a second quarrel. The old king and the good queen were again reconciled in 94 AC by the good offices of their daughter, Septa Magella, but never reached accord on the succession. The queen died of a wasting illness in 100 AC at the age of four and 60, still insisting that her granddaughter Rainey's and her children had been unfairly cheated of their rights. The boy in the belly, the unborn child who had been the subject of so much debate, proved to be a girl when born in 93 AC. Her mother named her Leanna. The next year, Rainey's gave her brother, Leonor. Prince Balon was firmly ensconced as heir apparent by then, yet House Valerion and House Baratheon clung to the belief that young Leonor had a better claim to the Iron Throne. And some few even argued for the rights of his elder sister, Leanna, and their mother, Rhaenys. In the last years of her life, the gods dealt Queen Alysanne many cruel blows, as has previously been recounted. Her grace knew joys as well as sorrows during the same years. However, chief amongst them, her grandchildren. There were weddings as well. In 93 AC, she attended the wedding of Prince Balon's eldest son, Viserys, to Lady Emma of House Arran, the 11-year-old child of the late Princess Diella. Their marriage was not consummated until the bride had flowered two years later. In 97, the good queen saw Balon's second son, Damon, take the wife, Lady Ray of House Royce, heir to the ancient castle of Runestone in the Vale. The great tourney held at King's Landing in 98 AC to celebrate the 50th year of King Jaharis's reign surely gladdened the Queen's heart as well, for most of her surviving children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren returned to share in the feasts and celebrations. Not since the doom of Valeria had so many dragons been seen in one place at one time, it was truly said. The final tilt were in the King's Garden Knights, Sir Raymond Redwine and Sir Clement Crabbe broke 30 lances against each other before King Jaharis proclaimed them co-champions was declared to be the finest display of jousting ever seen in Westeros. A fortnight after the tourney's end, however, the king's old friend, Septon Barth, died peacefully in his sleep after serving ably as Hand of the King for 41 years. Jaharis chose the Lord Commander of his King's Guard to take his place, but Sir Raymond Redwine was no Septon Barth, and his undoubted prowess with the lance proved of little use to him as Hand. Some problems cannot be solved by hitting them with a stick, Grandmaster Alar famously observed. His grace had no choice but to remove Sir Raymond after only a year in office. He turned to his son Balon to replace him, and in 99 AC, 
the Prince of Dragonstone became the king's hand as well. He performed his duties admirably. Though less scholarly than Septon Barth, the prince proved a good judge of men and surrounded himself with loyal subordinates and counsellors. The realm would be well ruled when Balon Targaryen sat the Iron Throne. Lords and common folk agreed. It was not to be. In 101 AC, Prince Balon complained of a stitch in his side whilst hunting in the Kingswood. The pain worsened when he returned to the city. His belly swelled and hardened, and the pain grew so severe it left him bedridden. Run Sitter, the new Grand Master, only recently arrived from the Citadel after Alar was felled by a stroke, was able to bring the Prince's fever down somewhat and gave him some relief from agony with milk of the poppy, but his condition continued to worsen. On the fifth day of his illness, Prince Balon died in his bedchamber in the Tower of the Hand, with his father sitting beside him, holding his hand. After opening the corpse, Grand Master Run put down the cause of death as a burst belly. All the seven kingdoms wept for brave Balon, and none more so than King Jaharis. This time, when he lit his son's funeral pyre, he did not even have the comfort of his beloved wife beside him. The old king had never been so alone, and now again his grace faced a nettlesome dilemma. For once more, the succession was in doubt. With both of the heirs apparent dead and burned, there was no longer a clear successor to the Iron Throne, but that was not to say there was any lack of claimants. Balon had sired three sons by his sister Elisa. Two, Viserys and Daemon, still lived. Had Balon ever taken the Iron Throne, Viserys would have followed him without question, but the Crown Prince's tragic death at the age of four and forty muddied the succession. The claims of Princess Rhaenys and her daughter, Lyanna Valeron, were put forward once again. And even if they were to be passed over on account of their sex, Rhaenys' son, Leonor, faced no such impediment. Leonor Valeron was male and could claim descent from Jaharis' elder son, whilst Balon's boys were descended from the younger. Moreover, King Jaharis still had one surviving son, Vagon, an archmaster at the Citadel, holder of the ring and rod and mask of yellow gold. Known to history as Vagon the Dragonless, his very existence had been largely forgotten by most of the Seven Kingdoms. Though only 40 years of age, Vagon was pale and frail, a bookish man devoted to alchemy, astronomy, mathematics and other arcane arts. Even as a boy, he had never been well liked. Few considered him a viable choice to sit on the Iron Throne. And yet, it was to Archmaster Vagon that the old king turned now, summoning his last son to King's Landing. What passed between them remains a matter of dispute. Some say the king offered Vagon the throne and was refused. Others assert that he only sought his counsel. Reports had reached the court that Corlys Valeron was massing ships and men on Driftmark to defend the rights of his son, Leonor, whilst Daemon Targaryen, a hot-tempered and quarrelsome young man of twenty, had gathered his own band of sworn swords in support of his brother Viserys. A violent struggle for succession was likely no matter who the old king named to succeed him. No doubt that was why his grace seized eagerly on the solution offered by Archmaster Vagon. King Jaharis announced his intent to convene a great council to discuss, debate and ultimately decide the matter of succession. All the great and lesser lords of Westeros would be invited to attend, together with maesters from the citadel of Old Town and septas and septons to speak for the faith. Let the claimants make their cases before the assembled lords, his grace decreed. He would abide by the council's decision, whomever they might choose. It was decided that the council would be held at Harrenhal, the largest castle in the realm. No one knew how many lords would come, since no such council had ever been held before, but it was thought prudent to have room for at least 500 lords and their tails. More than a thousand lords attended. It took half a year for them to assemble. A few arrived, even as the council was breaking up. Even Harrenhal could not contain such multitudes, for each lord was accompanied by a retinue of knights, squires, grooms, cooks and serving men. Tymon Lannister, Lord of Casterly Rock, brought 300 men with him, 
not to be outdone, Lord Mathos Tyrell of Highgarden brought 500. Lords came from every corner of the realm, from the Dornish marches to the shadow of the wall, from the Three Sisters to the Iron Islands. The evening star of Tarth was there, and the Lord of the Lonely Light. From Winterfell came Lord Ellard Stark, from River Run, Lord Grover Tully, from the Vale, Yorbert Royce, regent and protector for young Jane Arryn, Lady of the Eyrie. Even the Dornishmen were represented. The Prince of Dorne sent his daughter and twenty Dornish knights to Harren Hall as observers. The High Septum came from Old Town to bless the assembly. Merchants and tradesmen descended upon Harren Hall by the hundreds. Hedge knights and free riders came in hopes of finding work for their swords. Cut purses came seeking after coin. Old women and young girls came seeking after husbands. Thieves and whores, washerwomen and camp followers. Singers and murmurs, they came from east and west and north and south. A city of tents sprang up outside the walls of Harrenhal and along the lakeshore for leagues in each direction. For a time, Harrington was the fourth city in the realm. Only Old Town, King's Landing and Lannisport were larger. No fewer than 14 claims were duly examined and considered by the lords assembled. From Essos came three rival competitors, grandsons of King Jaharis through his daughter Sarah, each sired by a different father. One was said to be the very image of his grandsire in his youth. Another, a bastard born to a triarch of old Volantis, arrived with bags of gold and a dwarf elephant. The lavish gifts he distributed amongst the poor lords undoubtedly helped his claim. The elephant proved less useful. Princess Sarah herself was still alive and well in Volantis, and only 34 years of age. Her own claim was clearly superior to those of any of her bastard sons, but she did not choose to press it. I have my own kingdom here, she said, when asked if she meant to return to Westeros. Another contestant produced sheaves of parchment that demonstrated his descent from Gaiman the Glorious, the greatest of the Targaryen lords of Dragonstone before the conquest. By way of a younger daughter and the pretty lord she had married, and on for seven further generations. There was as well a strapping red-haired man-at-arms who claimed to be a bastard son of Megor the Cruel. By way of proof, he brought his mother, an aged innkeep's daughter, who said she had once been raped by Megor. The lords were prepared to believe the fact of rape, but not that the act had gotten her with child. The great council deliberated for 13 days. The tenuous claims of nine lesser competitors were considered and discarded. One such, a head knight who put himself forward as a natural son of King Jaharis himself, was seized and imprisoned when the king exposed him as a liar. Archmaster Vagon was ruled out on account of his vows and Prince Rhaenys and her daughter on account of their sex, leaving the two claimants with the most support, Viserys Targaryen, eldest son of Prince Balon and Princess Elisa, and Leonor Valeron, the son of Princess Rhaenys and grandson of Prince Aemon. Viserys was the old king's grandson, Leonor his great-grandson. The principle of primogeniture favoured Leonor, the principle of proximity, Viserys. Viserys had also been the last Targaryen to ride Balerion, though after the death of the Black Dread in 94 AC, he never mounted another dragon, whereas the boy Leonor had yet to take his first flight upon his young dragon, a splendid grey and white beast he named Sea Smoke. But Viserys' claim derived from his father, Leonor's from his mother, and most lords felt that the male line must take precedence over the female. Moreover, Viserys was a man of 24, Leonor a boy of 7. For all these reasons, Leonor's claim was generally regarded as a weaker, but the boy's mother and father were such powerful and influential figures that it could not be dismissed entirely. Mayhaps this would be a good place to add a few additional words about his sire, Corlys of House Valeron, Lord of the Tides and Master of Driftmark, renowned in song and story as a sea snake, and surely one of the most extraordinary figures of the age. A noble house with a storied Valerian lineage, the Valerons had come to Westeros even before the Targaryens, if their family histories can be believed, settling in Gullet on the low line of Fertile Isle of Driftmark, so named for the driftwood that the tides brought daily to its shores, 
rather than its stony, smoky neighbour, Dragonstone. Though never dragon riders, the Valerians had four centuries remained the oldest and closest allies of the Targaryens. The sea was their element, not the sky. During the conquest, it was Valerian ships that carried Aegon's soldiers across Blackwater Bay and later formed the greater part of the royal fleet. Throughout the first century of Targaryen rule, so many lords of the tide served on the small council as master of ships that the office was widely seen as almost hereditary. Yet even with such forebears, Corlys Valerian was a man apart, a man as brilliant as he was restless, as adventurous as he was ambitious. It was traditional for the sons of the seashore, the sigil of House Valerian, to be given a taste of seafarer's life when young, but no Valerian before or ever since ever took the shipboard life as eagerly as a boy who would become the sea snake. He first crossed the narrow sea at the age of six, sailing to Pentos with an uncle. Thereafter, Corliss made such voyages every year, nor did he travel as a passenger. He climbed masts, tied knots, scrubbed decks, pulled oars, caulked leaks, raised and lowered sails, manned the crow's nest, learned to navigate and steer. His captain said they had never seen such a natural sailor. At age 16, he became a captain himself, taking a fishing boat called the Cod Queen from Driftmark to Dragonstone and back. In the years that followed, his ships grew larger and swifter, his voyages longer and more dangerous. He took ships around the bottom of Westeros to visit Old Town, Lannisport and Lordsport and Pike. He sailed to Lys, Tyrosh and Pentos and Mare. He took the Summer Maid to Volantis and the Summer Isles and the Ice Wolf north to Bravos, East Watch by the Sea and Hardhome before turning into the Shivering Sea for Lorath and the Port of Ibn. On a later voyage, he and the Ice Wolf headed north once more, searching for a rumoured passage around the top of Westeros, but finding only frozen seas and icebergs big as mountains. His most famous voyages were those he made on the ship that he designed and built himself, the Sea Snake. Traders from Old Town and the Arbor off sailed as far as Carth in search of spice, silk and other treasures, but Corlys Valeron and the Sea Snake were the first to go beyond passing through the Jade Gates to Yiddy and the Isle of Lang, returning with so rich a load of silk and spice that he doubled the wealth of House Valerian on one stroke. On his second voyage in the Sea Snake, he sailed even farther, to Ashai by the Shadow. On his third, he tried the Shivering Sea instead, becoming the first Westerosi to navigate the Thousand Islands and visit the bleak, cold shores of Nagai and Mosavai. In the end, the Sea Snake made nine voyages, on the ninth, Sir Corlys took her back to Carth, laden with enough gold to buy 20 more ships and load them all with saffron, pepper, nutmeg, elephants and bolts of the finest silk. Only 14 of the fleet arrived safely at Driftmark and all the elephants died at sea. Yet even so, the profits from the voyage were so vast that the Valerians became the wealthiest house in the Seven Kingdoms, eclipsing even the High Towers and Lannisters, albeit briefly. This wealth Sir Corlys put to good use when his aged grandsire died at the age of 80 and 8 and the sea snake became lord of the tides. The seat of House Valeron was Castle Driftmark, a dark, grim place, always damp and often flooded. Lord Corlys raised a new castle on the far side of the island. High Tide was built of the same pale stone as the Erie, its slender towers crowned with roofs of beaten silver that flashed in the sun. When the morning and evening tides rolled in, the castle was surrounded by the sea, connected to Driftmark proper only by a causeway. To this new castle, Lord Corliss moved the ancient Driftwood throne, a gift from the Merning King, according to legend. The sea snake built ships as well. The royal fleet tripled in size during the years he served the old king as master of ships. Even after giving up that office, he continued to build, turning out merchantmen and trading galleys in place of warships. Beneath the dark, salt-stained walls of Castle Driftmark, three modest fishing villages grew together in a thriving town called Hull, for the rows of ship hulls that could always be seen below the castle. Across the island, near High Tide, another village was transformed into Spice Town, its wharves and piers crowded with ships from the free cities and beyond. Sitting athwart the gullet, 
Driftmark was closer to the Narrow Sea than Duckensdale or King's Landing, so Spice Town soon became to usurp much of the shipping that would elsewise have made for those ports, and House Valeron grew even richer and more powerful. Lord Corliss was an ambitious man. During his nine voyages on the Sea Snake, he was forever wanting to press onward, to go where no one had gone before and see what lay beyond the maps. Though he had accomplished much and more in his life, he was seldom satisfied, the men who knew him best would say. In Rainey's Targaryen, daughter of the old king's eldest son and heir, he had found his perfect match. A woman as spirited and beautiful and proud as in any realm, and a dragon rider as well. His sons and daughters would soar through the skies, Lord Corliss expected, and one day, one of them would sit the Iron Throne. Unsurprisingly, the sea snake was bitterly disappointed when Prince Aemon died and King Jaehaerys bypassed Aemon's daughter, Rhaenys, in favour of his brother, Balon, the Spring Prince. But now, it seemed, the wheel had turned again and the wrong could be righted. Thus did Lord Corliss and his wife, the Princess Rhaenys, arrive at Harrenhal in high state, using the wealth and influence of House Valeron to persuade the lords assembled that their son, Leonor, should be recognised as heir to the Iron Throne. In these efforts, they were joined by the lords of Storm's End, Borman Baratheon, great-uncle to Rhaenys and great-great-uncle to the boy Leonor, by Lord Stark of Winterfell, Lord Manderley of White Harbour, Lord Dustin of Barrentown, Lord Blackwood of Raventree, Lord Bar Eamon of Sharp Point, Lord Celtigar of Chloral, and others. They were nowhere near enough. Though Lord and Lady Valerion were elegant and open-handed in their efforts on behalf of their son, the decision of the Great Council was never truly in doubt. By a lopsided margin, the Lords assembled chose Viserys Targaryen as their rightful heir to the Iron Throne. Though the Meisters who tallied the votes never revealed the actual numbers, it was said afterward that the vote had been more than 20 to 1. King Jaehaerys had not attended the council, but when word of their verdict reached him, his grace thanked the lords for their service and gratefully conferred the stout prince of Dragonstone upon his grandson Viserys. Storm's End and Driftmark accepted the decision, if grudgingly. The vote had been so overwhelming that even Leonor's father and mother saw that they could not hope to prevail. In the eyes of many, the Great Council of 101 AC thereby established an Iron President on matters of succession. Regardless of seniority, the Iron Throne of Westeros could not pass to a woman, nor through a woman to her male descendants. Of the last years in the reign of King Jaehaerys, little and less need be said. Prince Balon had served his father as Hand of the King as well as Prince of Dragonstone, but after his death, his grace elected to divide these honours. As his new hand, he called upon Sir Otto Hightower, younger brother to Lord Hightower of Old Town. Sir Otto brought his wife and children to court with him and served King Jaehaerys faithfully for the years remaining to him. As the old king's strength and wits began to fail, he was off confined to his bed. Sir Otto's precocious 15-year-old daughter, Alicent, became his constant companion, fetching his grace his meals, reading to him, helping him to bathe and dress himself. The old king sometimes mistook her for one of his daughters, calling her by their names. Near the end, he grew certain she was his daughter, Sierra, returned to him from beyond the narrow sea. In the year 103 AC, King Jaehaerys I Targaryen died in his bed as Lady Alicent was reading to him from Septon Barth's Unnatural History. His grace was nine and sixty years of age and had reigned over the Seven Kingdoms since coming to the Iron Throne at the age of 14. His remains were burned in the dragon pit, his ashes interred with good Queen Alicene's at Dragonstone. All of Westeros mourned, even in Dorne, where his right had not extended, men wept and women tore their garments. In accordance with his own wishes and the decision of the Great Council of 101, his grandson Viserys succeeded him, mounting the Iron Throne as King Viserys I Targaryen. At the time of his ascent, King Viserys was 26 years old. He had been married for a decade to a cousin, Lady Emma, of House Arryn, herself a granddaughter of the old king and good Queen Alicene, 
through her mother, the late Princess Diana, who died in 82 AC. Lady Emma had suffered several miscarriages and the death of one son in the cradle over the course of her marriage. Some masters felt she had been married and bedded too young. But she also gave birth to a healthy daughter, Rhianra, born 97 AC. The new king and his queen both doted on the girl, their only living child. Many consider the reign of King Viserys I to represent the apex of Targaryen power in Westeros. Beyond a doubt, there were more lords and princes claiming the blood of the dragon than at any period before that or since. Though the Targaryens had continued the traditional practice of marrying brother to sister, uncle to niece, and cousin to cousin wherever possible, there had also been important matches outside the royal family, the fruit of which would play important roles in the war to come. There were more dragons than ever before as well, and several of the she-dragons were regularly producing clutches of eggs. Not all of these eggs hatched, but many did, and it became customary for the fathers and mothers of newborn princelings to place a dragon's egg in their cradles, following a tradition that Princess Rihanna had begun many years before. The children so blessed invariably bonded with the hatchlings to become dragon riders. Viserys, the first Targaryen, had a generous, amiable nature and was well loved by his lords and small folk alike. The reign of the young king, as the commons called him upon his ascent, was peaceful and prosperous. His grace's open-handedness was legendary, and the Red Keep became a place of song and splendour. King Viserys and Queen Emma hosted many a feast and tourney and lavished gold, offices and honours on their favourites. At the centre of their merriment, cherished and adored by all, was their only surviving child, Princess Rhianra, the little girl the court singers dubbed the realm's delight. Though only six when her father came to the Iron Throne, Rhianra Targaryen was a precocious child, bright and bold and beautiful, as only one of dragon's blood could be beautiful. At seven, she became a dragon rider, taking to the sky of the young dragon she named Cyrax, after a goddess of old Valeria. At eight, the princess was placed into service as a cupbearer for her own father, the king. At table, at tourney and at court, King Viserys thereafter was seldom seen without his daughter by his side. Meanwhile, the tedium of rule was left largely to the king's small council and his hand. Sir Otto Hightower had continued in that office, serving the grandson as he had the grandsire. An able man, all agreed, though many found him proud, brusque and haughty. The longer he served, the more imperious Sir Otto became, it was said, and many great lords and princes came to resent his manner and envy him in access to the Iron Throne. The greatest of his rivals was Daemon Targaryen, the king's ambitious, impetuous, moody younger brother. As charming as he was hot-tempered, Prince Daemon had earned the knight's spurs at six and ten, and had been given dark sister by the old king himself in recognition of his prowess. Though he had wed the Lady of Runestone in 97 AC during the old king's reign, the marriage had not been a success. Prince Damon found the Vale of Arran boring. In the Vale, the men fuck sheep, he wrote. You cannot fault them. Their sheep are prettier than their women. And soon developed a mislike for his lady wife, whom he called my bronze bitch, after the runic bronze armour worn by the lords of House Royce. Upon the accession of his brother to the Iron Throne, the prince petitioned to have his marriage set aside. Viserys denied the request, but did allow Damon to return to court, where he sat on the small council, serving as master of coin from 103 to 104, and master of laws for half a year in 104. Governs bored this warrior prince, however. He did better when King Viserys made him commander of the city watch. Finding the watchman ill-armed and clad in oddments and rags, Damon equipped each man with dirk, short sword and cudgel, armoured them in black ringmail with breastplates for the officers and gave them long golden cloaks that they might wear with pride. Ever since, the men of the city watch have been known as the gold cloaks. Prince Damon took eagerly to the work of the gold cloaks and off prowled the alleys of King's Landing with his men. That he made the city more orderly, no man can doubt, but his discipline was a brutal one. He delighted in cutting off the hands of pickpockets, gelding rapists and slitting the noses of thieves, 
and slew three men in street brawls during his first year as commander. Before long, the prince was well known in all the low places of King's Landing. He became a familiar sight in wine sinks, where he drank for free, and gambling pits, where he always left with more coin than when he entered. Though he sampled countless whores in the city brothels, and was said to have an especial fondness for the flowering maidens, a certain Lassane dancing girl soon became his favourite. Mysaria was the name she went by, though her rivals and enemies called her Misery, the White Worm. As King Viserys had no living son, Damon regarded himself as the rightful heir to the Iron Throne and coveted the title Prince of Dragonstone, which his grace refused to grant him. But by the end of year 105 AC, he was known to his friends as the Prince of the City and to the small folk as Lord Fleabottom. Though the king did not wish Damon to succeed him, he remained fond of his younger brother and was quick to forgive his many offences. Princess Rhaenyra was also enamoured for her uncle, for Damon was ever attractive to her. Whenever he crossed the narrow sea upon his dragon, he brought her some exotic gift on his return. The king had grown soft and plump over the years. Viserys never claimed another dragon after Beleriand's death, nor did he have much taste for the joust, the hunt, or swordplay, whereas Prince Damon excelled in these fears and seemed all that his brother was not. Lean and hard, a renowned warrior, dashing, daring, more than a little dangerous. And here we must digress to say a word about our sources. For much of what happened in the years that followed happened behind closed doors, in the privacy of stairwells, council rooms and bedchambers, and the full truth of it will likely never be known. We have of course the chronicles laid down by Grand Meister Insider and his successors, and many a court document as well, all the royal decrees and proclamations, but these tell only a part of the story. For the rest, we must look to accounts written decades later by the children and grandchildren of those caught up in the events of these times. Lords and knights reporting events witnessed by their forebears, third-hand recollections and aged serving men relating their scandals of their youth. Whilst these are undoubtedly of use, so much time passed between the event and the recording that many confusions and contradictions have inevitably crept in, nor do these remembrances always agree. Unfortunately, this is also true of the two accounts by first-hand observers that have come down to us, Septon Eustace, who served in the Royal Sept in the Red Keep during much of this time and later rose to the ranks of the most devout, set down the most detailed history of this period. As a confidant and confessor to King Viserys and his queens, Eustace was well placed to know much and more of what went on, nor was his reticent about recording even the most shocking and salacious rumours and accusations through the bulk of the reign of King Viserys, first of his name and the dance of the dragons that came after, remains a sober and somewhat ponderous history. To balance Eustace, we have the testimony of Mushroom, based upon the verbal account of the court fool, set down by a scribe who failed to append his name, who at various times capered for the amusement of King Viserys, Princess Rhaenyra, and both Aegons the second and third. A three foot tall dwarf possessed of enormous head, and he avers an even more enormous member. Mushroom was thought feeble minded, so kings and lords and princes did not scruple to hide their secrets from him. Whereas Septim Eustis records the secrets of bedchamber and brothel in hushed, contemplatory tones, Mushroom delights in the same, and his testimony consists of little ribald tales and gossip, piling stabbings, poisonings, betrayals, seductions and debaucheries, one on top of the other. How much of this can be believed is a question the historians cannot hope to answer, but it is worth noting that King Baelor the Blessed decreed that every copy of Mushroom's Chronicle should be burned. Fortunately for us, a few escaped his fires. Septim Eustace and Mushroom did not always agree upon particulars, and at times their accounts are considerably a variance with one another. And with the court records and the chronicles of Grand Meister Runnister and his successors, Yet their tales do explain much and more that might otherwise seem puzzling. The later accounts confirm enough of their stories to suggest that they contain at least some portion of truth. The question of what to believe and what to doubt remains for each student to decide. 
On one point, Mushroom, Septum Eustis, and Grand Meister Resonator, and all the other sources concur. Sir Otto Hightower, the King's Hand, took a great dislike to the King's brother. It was Sir Otto who convinced Viserys to remove Prince Damon as Master of Coin, and then as Master of Laurels. Actions the Hand soon came to regret. As commander of the City Watch, with 2,000 men under his command, Damon waxed more powerful than ever. On no account can Prince Damon be allowed to ascend to the Iron Throne, the Hand wrote his brother, Lord of Old Town. He would be a second Magor the Cruel, or worse. It was Sir Otto's wish, then, that Prince Rhianra succeeded her father. Better the realm's delight than Lord Fleabottom, he wrote. Nor was he alone in his opinion. Yet his party faced a formidable hurdle. If the president, set by the great council of 101, was followed, a male claimant must prevail over a female. In the absence of a true-born son, the king's brother would come before the king's daughter, as Balon had came before Rhaenys in 92 AC. As for the king's own views, all the chronicles agreed that King Viserys hated dissension. Though far from blind to his brother's flaws, he cherished his memories of the free-spirited, adventurous boy that Damon had been. His daughter was his life's great joy, he oft said, but a brother is a brother. Time and time again, he stove to make peace between Prince Damon and Sir Otto, but the enmity between the two men rolled endlessly beneath the false smiles that wore at court. When pressed upon the matter, King Viserys would only say that he was certain his queen would soon present him with a son. And in 105 AC, he announced to the court and small council that Queen Emma was once again with child. During that same fateful year, Sir Criston Cole was appointed to the King's Guard to fill the place created by the death of the legendary Sir Rydman Redwine. Born the son of a steward and serviced Lord Dondarrion of Blackhaven, Sir Criston was a commonly young knight of three and twenty years. He first came to the attention of the court when he won the melee held at Maidenpool in honour of King Viserys' ascension. In the final moments of the fight, Sir Criston knocked Dark Sister from Prince Damon's hand with his morning star, to the delight of his grace and the fury of the prince. Afterward, he gave the seven-year-old princess Rhianra the victor's laurel and begged for her favour to wear in the joust. In the lists, he defeated Prince Damon once again and unhorsed both of the celebrated Cargill twins, Sir Eric and Sir Eric of the Kingsguard, before failing to Lord Lyman Malister. With his pale green eyes, coal black hair and easy charm, Cole soon became a favourite of all the ladies at court, not the least amongst them, Rhianra Targaryen herself. So smitten was she by the charms of the man she called my white knight, that Rhianra begged her father to name Sir Criston her own personal shield and protector. His grace indulged her in this, as in so much else. Thereafter, Sir Criston always wore her favour in the lists and became a fixture at her side during feasts and frolics. Not long after Sir Criston donned his white cloak, King Viserys invited Lionel Strong, Lord of Harrenhal, to join the small council as Master of Laws. A big man, burly and balding, Lord Strong enjoyed a formidable reputation as a battler. Those who did not know him oft took him for a brute, mistaking his silences and slowness for speech stupidity. This was far from the truth. Lord Lionel had studied at the Citadel as a youth, earning six licks of his chain before deciding that a master's life was not for him. He was literate and learned, his knowledge of the laws of the Seven Kingdoms exhaustive. Thrice wed and thrice a widower, the Lord of Harrenhal brought two maiden daughters and two sons to court with him. The girls became handmaids to Princess Rhianra, whilst her elder brother, Sir Harwin Strong, called Breakbones, was made a captain in the gold cloaks. The younger boy, Larry's the clubfoot, joined the king's confessors. Thus did matters stand in King's Landing late in the year 105 AC, when Queen Emma, who brought to bed in Magor's Holdfast and died whilst giving birth to the son that Viserys Targaryen had desired for so long. The boy, named Balon after the king's father, survived her only by a day, leaving king and court bereft, save perhaps for Prince Daemon who was observed in a brothel in the Street of Silk, 
making drunken japes with his high-born cronies about their heir for a day. When word of this got back to the king, legend says that it was the whore sitting in Damon's lap who informed on him, but evidence suggests it was actually one of his drinking companions, a captain in the gold cloaks eager for advancement. Viserys became livid. His grace had finally had a surfeit of his ungrateful brother and his ambitions. Once his mourning for his wife and son had run its course, the king moved swiftly to resolve the long simmering issue of the succession. Disregarding the precedents set by King Jaharis in 92 and the Great Council in 101, Viserys declared his daughter, Rhianra, to be his rightful heir and named her Princess of Dragonstone. In a lavish ceremony at King's Landing, hundreds of lords did obedience to the realm's delight as she sat at her father's feet at the base of the Iron Throne, swearing to honour and defend her right of succession. Prince Damon was not amongst them, however. Furious at the king's decree, the prince quit King's Landing, resigning from the city watch. He went first to Dragonstone, taking his paramour, Marseria, with him upon the back of his dragon, Caraxes the lean red beast the small folk called the Bloodwine. There he remained for half a year, during which time he got Messaria with child. When he learned that his concubine was pregnant, Prince Damon presented her with a dragon's egg. But in this, he again went too far and woke his brother's wrath. King Viserys commanded him to return the egg, send his whore away and return to his lawful wife or else be attainted as a traitor. The prince obeyed, though with ill grace, dispatching Messaria eggless back to Lice, whilst he himself flew to Runestone in the Vale and the unwelcome company of his bronze bitch. But Messaria lost her child during a storm in the narrow sea. When word reached Prince Damon, he spoke no syllable of grief, but his heart hardened against the king, his brother. Thereafter, he spoke of King Viserys only with disdain and began to brood day and night on the succession. Though Princess Rhaenyra had been proclaimed her father's successor, there were many in the realm, at court and beyond it, who still hoped that Viserys might father a male heir, for the young king was not yet 30. Grand Master Rinsinner was the first to urge his grace to remarry, even suggesting a suitable choice, the Lady Lyanna Valeron, who had just turned 12. A fiery young maiden, freshly flowered, Lady Lyanna had inherited the beauty of a true Targaryen from her mother, Rhaenys, and a bold and adventurous spirit from her father, the Sea Snake. As Lord Corlys loved to sail, Lyanna loved to fly, and had claimed for her own no less amount than the mighty Vagar, the oldest and largest of the Targaryen dragons since the passing of the Black Dread in 94 AC. By taking the girl to wife, the king could heal the rift that had been growing up between the Iron Throne and Driftmark, when Sinner pointed out, and Lyanna would surely make a splendid queen. Viserys, the first Targaryen, was not the strongest willed of kings, it must be said, always amiable and anxious to please. He relied greatly on the counsel of the men around him and did as they bade more often than not. In this instance, however, his grace had his own notion and no amount of argument would sway him from his course. He would marry again, yes, but not to a 12-year-old girl, and not for reasons of state. Another woman had caught his eye. He announced his intention to wed Lady Alicent of House Hightower, the clever and lovely 18-year-old daughter of the King's Hand, the girl who had read to King Jaharis as he lay dying. The Hightowers of Old Town were an ancient and noble family of impeccable lineage. There could be no possible objection to the King's choice of bride. Even so, there were those who murmured that the Hand had risen above himself that he had brought his daughter to court with this in mind. A few even cast doubt on Lady Alicent's virtue, suggesting she had welcomed King Viserys into her bed even before Queen Emma's death. These calumnies were never proved, though Mushroom repeats them in his testimony and goes so far as to claim that reading was not the only service that Lady Alicent performed for the old king in his bedchamber. In the veil, Prince Damon reportedly whipped the serving man who brought the news to him within an inch of his life. Nor was the sea snake pleased when the word reached Driftmark. House Valerion had been passed over once again. His daughter, Lyanna, scorned just as his son, Leonor, 
had been scorned by the great council and his wife by the old king back in 92 AC. Only Lady Leanna herself seemed untroubled. Her ladyship shows far more interest in flying than in boys, the maester at high tide wrote at the citadel. When King Viserys took Alicent Hightower to wife in 106 AC, House Valerion was notable for its absence. Princess Rhaenyra poured for her stepmother at the feast, and Queen Alicent kissed her and named her daughter. The princess was amongst the women who disrobed the king and delivered him to the bedchamber of his bride. Laughter and love ruled the Red Keep that night, whilst across Blackwater Bay, Lord Corlys the Seed Snake welcomed the king's brother, Prince Damon, to a war council. The prince had suffered all he could stand of the Vale of Arran, Runestone, and his lady wife. Dark Sister was made for a nobler task than slaughtering sheep, he had reported to have told the Lord of the Tides. She has a thirst for blood. But it was not rebellion that the prince had in mind. He saw another path to power. You know the crack by now. Tune in next week for the concluding part of chapter 12.